Hi, I'm John Kenalopoulos, a uh, eye surgeon uh, based here in Athens, Greece at the Laser Vision uh, Amateur Surgery Center and part-time in New York City clinical professor at the uh, NYU Medical School in uh, New York City, New York. And uh, we'll discuss a little bit about uh, one of our favorite subjects or if you may, the subjects we are known uh, in the ophthalmic community for over two decades now, uh, that is uh, keratoconus. And uh, we have for over 15 years popularized an alternative to cornea transplantations for advanced keratoconus. We can see here an example, this is a patient uh, that I personally operated on uh, three months ago. Uh, this advanced cone uh, 15, 20 years ago was an indication for someone who could not cope with uh, uh, very difficult uh, contact lens wear uh, to have a cornea transplant done. So we can see how uh, we went from here to here with the Athens protocol, our signature combination cross-linking technique where we reshape the cornea with a very um, customized laser ablation um, and then also use adjunct higher fluence uh, cornea cross-linking to get a far normalized cornea. Uh, and this is the uh, difference when we subtract the post-op three months later from the pre-op. And you can see how uh, accurate the area of cornea flattening is for, at the, uh, for the cone and how the uh, upper part of the cornea that was flattened from the ectasia, we were able to reshape and re-elevate in order to create a more normal cornea. Of course, the best treatment is always prognosis and avoiding the reasons that cause keratoconus. And here in Greece, we live in an environment where we recently studied uh, our cataract surgery population, which are people usually over 60, and we are astounded to find that one out of 10 has clinical keratoconus based on these topographic maps, and most of them without even knowing it. Uh, and this was the time that they reached the level to have cataract surgery. Um, we estimate that one out of four has suspicion for keratoconus. And we know the keratoconus is inherited, so you need to have the genetic uh, predisposition from one of your two parents, and it needs another pivotal thing for it to develop, and that is eye rubbing. And the way keratoconus people rub their eyes is not the usual rubbing of the eyes softly like many women do when they remove makeup or we do when we have a little bit of itchiness. They rub their eyes with their knuckles. It's very characteristic. And uh, I'll share with you two examples to underline the importance of eye rubbing. This is a gentleman that I saw uh, yesterday. A 35-year-old gentleman with known keratoconus for two years. Usually 35 is the age where we're not concerned a lot about progression because we feel that the years that have gone by uh, have the ability to stabilize the progression of the keratoconus. So he's aware for two years now that he should not rub his eyes uh, and he doesn't do it obviously during the day. But if we look at his epithelial maps, these are the cornea epithelial maps with this fascinating technology by OptiView. We can see that the epithelium has remodeled drastically to accommodate the biomechanical forces um, that the patient is uh, applying to his cornea. And we're absolutely certain when we see this picture, we've shared this with colleagues uh, globally, that our patient is an eye rubber during his sleep. And indeed, after a careful questioning, he does sleep on his right eye, this is a right eye, and on his knuckles. So without him knowing, uh, subconsciously, he rubs his cornea onto his knuckles and this is an example where we expect the keratoconus to progress rapidly. Now, we'll jump from here, and again, a 35-year-old gentleman, to a gentleman that is uh, uh, 20. So in an age group uh, that is uh, much higher suspect, and I think uh, all cornea specialists will agree for keratoconus progression. And we can see that the keratoconus here in this 20-year-old gentleman, who also is aware of his diagnosis for two years and is also uh, avoiding eye rubbing, uh, at least consciously, uh, is less significant than the one that we saw before. But the question arises, how soon should we see him? Should we have him videotape himself sleeping? Because we're obviously concerned if he rubs his eyes during his sleep. And these, uh, this is the epithelial maps of that younger 20-year-old patient uh, that is the exact opposite of the previous epithelial map that we saw. We can see that the epithelium here is naive it's almost homogeneous, uh, a flat green color, which for us is a uh, reassurance stamp that the patient is not an eye rubber during his sleep. This gives us a lot of uh, uh, time 
and a lot of relief that we don't have to really follow him that closely unless his vision changes. Um, and um, of course, we will not investigate in great detail the sleep pattern because this is a naive epithelium indicative of uh, none rubbing of the eyes in a patient that we ordinarily would be more concerned. So I wanted with these two examples to underline the importance of eye rubbing and how we have technology today to uh, substantiate it and prove and document uh, whether this happens or not. And uh, I'm going to close with a do-it-yourself special mask that for those of our patients that sleep face down or turn in their sleep, and rub their eyes either directly on their knuckles or even under the pillow uh, to uh, make a do-it-yourself special face mask. This is nothing more than a uh, sleep mask that you can uh, purchase anywhere on the web or from uh, uh, travel uh, uh, accessory stores or from uh, stores that sell cosmetics. Uh, it's kind of soft, so it's a little bit of cushiony. And uh, this is an eye shield. This is a clear eye shield. Uh, every ophthalmologist on the planet uses this, um, and you can uh, uh, obtain these from any uh, pharmacy uh, or uh, uh, pharmacy uh, warehouse. If you cannot contact us, and we'll definitely uh, share the information with you. So this is what a clear eye shield looks like, and we use it usually uh, after procedures. We tape this on patient's eyes after procedure, so they don't rub their eyes during sleep, and they don't, uh, take the risk for an infection, but obviously you can't do this on a daily basis if you're a keratoconic patient. So you can use an eye shield in between two sleep masks. So sleep mask number one, we will place an eye shield in between and then face mask number two. And then here we need a little bit of a sewing skill to sew these two together and create a very comfortable face mask that will have a, a hard shell uh, eye shield that has really soft borders uh, and uh, will enable us, obviously we'll do the same thing for the left eye in this mask as well, will enable our patients to place this over their eyes, sleep comfortably and rest assured that there will be no manipulation with their hands on their eyes, especially if they are more of the uh, type uh, one patient that I showed you. A very drastic tool, perhaps the most effective treatment to avoid the development of keratoconus. We have seen, we've posted it on our YouTube channel, our Laser Vision YouTube channel, the drastic improvement in eyes that have stopped, uh, have ceased eye rubbing uh, in their corneas without any other um, intervention and definitely no surgical intervention. So to avoid reaching a level of keratoconus that will need uh, a procedure like our Athens protocol, or uh, even cornea transplantation. My advice is study the way you sleep. It may sound a little bit uh, uh, comical, but um, taping yourself during sleep, it's impossible to, to recall how we sleep at night. And uh, picking up perhaps a habit where during our sleep we turn face down or we bring our hands to our eyes and rub our eyes is very important to be able to uh, prevent it uh, with a measure similar to the one that I showed you. I hope you found this presentation interesting. This is uh, uh, John Kanalopoulos from our Ambitory Surgery Center here in Athens, Greece, uh, signing out. And thank you for so much for your attention.